Now we're here waiting to meet with the city manager where Ian has some questions right. for him. Do you have a, like a game plan? What are you going to start out um, with? Well, I mean, I first I need to find out if he can answer the questions because the tax collector told me he might be able to, or maybe it was the city attorney, or maybe it was the legislature. So I figured since I've, I've met John in the past, I figured I'd start with John. And, and, and John's questions are about property taxes? They're about uh, just the nature of government in general as well as property taxes. And you can read them over at freekeen.com. All right. We also have uh, David, Tim, and Jesse here with us. And we're waiting for Mr. McLean to step into the office yep. here. We're a little early. So we're here today, um, and John, I really appreciate you coming out Certainly. to talk to us because there are a lot of people, and that's why these gentlemen are here, is to show that it's not just me that's interested in getting the answers to these questions, but a bunch of people are very curious about these. You've had a chance to review them. I did. And um, so I guess I'll start with question number one. Uh, factually, what are the city of Keene and the state of New Hampshire? Well. I'm going to just give you the answer that I would give to a person. It's, I want to make sure that you understand that I'm not in a position to represent um, the Attorney General's office for the state of New Hampshire, nor do I intend to do that. But uh, as I understand it, and, and I've been working in local government now for a number of years, as I understand it, we derive as the city of Keene our authority through the charter. The charter is given to us by the state of New Hampshire, which in essence controls everything that a municipality can say or do and in this since we're not a home rule state which means we don't have authority unless it's expressly granted to us that's the only authority we get so if this if the uh, New Hampshire legislature has said you may do this or you shall do this or you will do this then that's what we do or mm -hmm. we might do if it's discretionary but unless it's uh, specifically stated in that fashion uh, if it's he's silent, if it's never been stated before, or it's prohibited. We can't take any action that's not granted to us by the state of New Hampshire. The state of New Hampshire, I'm not a constitutionalist to that extent, but as I understand it, derives its powers uh, from the federal government in certain extent, to the extent that the federal government has control over certain aspects of, of government. I know we fought a civil war over you know, confederacies versus, you know, things of that nature. And I know it goes back to colonial days, particularly with the, with the you know, state of New Hampshire having a colonial past, where all land grants and powers were given to us by a king, how it migrated from there into the Constitution, the court cases, and the things that have happened since have all evolved to produce a state constitution and obviously the laws that they prescribe through a representative process. Okay. That would be my answer. Fair enough, fair enough. And you did mention the uh, Attorney General. Would, would that be a suggestion as to who else might be able to answer these questions? Yeah, I think so. I think, you okay. know. Because I'm also interested in getting answers from others. Exactly. I think that when you get into the legitimacy of a sovereignty, whether it be municipality uh, or, uh, or the individual's rights or the state, mm -hmm. I think you're probably talking about having a conversation with the Attorney General's office. So, um, question number two. We'll just go through them and again. Like you said, you give whatever um, you can give. Uh, do the group of men and women calling themselves the City of Keene have authority over me, a sovereign individual? Well, that's a tough question. Um, There's a follow-up. If the answer is yes, uh, what are the origins of and how did you, as a member of that group, receive the authority? Well, it's not. I don't think it's that easy in black and white terms. Um, certainly, you have unalienable rights, and uh, what we talk in terms of, for example, let's take this whole issue of paying property taxes. Uh, you can't be forced to pay those property taxes. However, there's a penalty if you don't pay them. And that penalty, as I understand it, is that the people calling themselves the city will steal my house from me. Well, we wouldn't use those lang that language. Of course not. You know, we would say that you forced us to take your property. Oh really? Okay. And how is that? Well, if you don't pay your if you don't pay your property tax bill, it's the same for me as well as it is for you. I own property in the city of Keene. If I don't pay that property tax bill, and it goes into a statutory process, and I've given those opportunities to pay it and don't pay it, well, uh, then the state has empowered or authorized municipalities across sure. the state to go through a process where they take the property. It's a tax now, sale. It's right. a tax sale and a lien against the property. In the event that it goes to that. Uh, they have to get the a fair market for the property, at which point um, any excess above what you owe would go back to you. I, I do understand the general idea of the tax sale process, but what I'm curious about is, 
the obligation. And as I uh, requested from his author here in the, my original, first of all, I sent a notarized document to her, you know, a month and a half ago. Uh, she wrote back. She didn't answer any of the questions. So I sent this follow-up yep. that I, I gave you earlier. And one of the things that, from my understanding of your set of rules, the government's code or RSAs, I guess they call them here, um, yes. in your own rules, there's this uniform commercial code um, document. Are you familiar with that? Uh, from my, from my understanding, the Uniform Commercial Code is just this general set of rules that all those who are engaging in commerce must abide by, um, especially those who are in government because it's right there codified in, in their statutes. Right. So from my understanding of the Uniform Commercial Code, whenever someone presents a bill to another person, uh, then that, if upon request, that the person presenting the bill has to show proof of obligation. So you, you can't just come and you know repave my driveway and then give me a bill for it and say, well, you owe me $10,000 because I'm going to say, well, wait a minute. I mean, if that's true, I'll pay your bill, but you know, you've got to show me where I originally agreed to this, you know, as opposed to you just being a gypsy coming through and doing work that I never asked you to do. That's right. So my question to Ms. Alther and, and now to you is, is it possible for you to show the uh, valid original instrument with my signature binding me to some sort of agreement to pay these property taxes and that, you know, an agreement to abide by that system that you were describing. Do you recall signing one? I don't. Okay. So you haven't signed such an agreement? No, and I don't recall making a verbal agree no, agreement. No, I'm sure you have. Either. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not in a position to say what's implied by ownership in, in, you know, in this country and in this particular state as well as this municipality. Although I believe that there's a contract implied, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to talk about a, a contracts. When we purchase property, whether it's in the city of Keene or any township or any community across the land, um, there has been a system that's been established, as you know, and of course you know all this, and that is that you know that you will pay property taxes. Now it varies from community to community relative to those property taxes. What you know, how, what the tax rate might be, whether there are other ways of paying, you know, that supplement um, the, the cost of government, whether it be education, or or whether it be the county government, or whether it be the city government. From what I know, it's implied when we own property that we're paying property taxes. That there is a system that has been deemed to be lawful and put in place that protects individual rights. What it doesn't give us is the ability to say we won't pay it. If we, but we can do that. But there is a penalty prescribed if you don't pay your property sure. tax bill. And, and I, it would be the same for you as it would be for me. I, I'm not here to argue with you today. I and understand. so I understand the implications of what it is that you're getting at. But I do have understand. you ever signed anything? Not that I'm aware of. Have you ever come to the city hall or any other place and said, I am willingly paying my property taxes? I'm not aware of anything like that happening. But um, I'm not aware of that um, typically we for go back, anybody. Ha have you read the Constitution of New Hampshire? No, and it's, you know I really haven't read the okay. entirety of the Constitution of New Hampshire. Have you read the beginning of the Constitution of New Hampshire? What's the point? Because I haven't read the, the whole thing either, okay? But I have read the first sentence, and it does say in the first sentence that uh, the government is created by the consent of the governed. Is it possible to withdraw consent? If there's a process of withdrawing consent relative to the taxation of government, I'm not sure. I, I'm not aware of what it would be. Okay. Let's move uh, back to the questions here. Number three, is your government a voluntary... Again, I think that's an excellent question for the Attorney General's office. Okay. Is your government a voluntary association of consenting individuals? Well, <laughs> is my government. So you don't, you don't recognize the government that we, that we live in under at this point. I, uh, I recognize individuals and their actions. Of course. And, and what they do to other individuals. All right. But you don't recognize the United States government? I'm not sure what that is. Okay. If it's a collection of men and women calling themselves government and then threatening people by You can by see force. how difficult it is to answer these questions. Sure. You need to obviously tell me more about your thought process when it comes to that. It's the same thing for me. Is there a government in the United States of America? Yes, there is. It's lawfully constituted, I believe it is. Um, does every citizen in this country uh, read the constitutions, etc.? Probably not. As a matter of fact, what we find out is that many people don't afford themselves the opportunity of knowing more about their government and what it is that, that they are consenting to. Now, do we have the right to not consent? I suppose people have that right through, and, and some people are expatriates and, and for that reason, and, they, and they, so they choose to leave and go someplace else. Mm -hmm. I've, so, I've never said that to anyone, nor have I ever thought that for myself. Uh, I recognize personally that there's an obligation. Um, and, and that one of the obligations, of course, is to vote 
and to get involved and to run for government and to be part of a change agent process. For some, it may be too slow or not enough. Uh, uh, question number four. Do you believe you have the right to aggress against those peaceful sovereigns who do not consent to your government? Well, I wouldn't say that we're aggressing. Uh, the city obviously is, can't force a person to make a payment on their property taxes, and but will get their fair share of the cost of, uh, of uh, providing community services. And the way they do that, of course, would be to sell the property if ultimately yeah. that's required. How is that not force? Well, because, I mean, if I don't pay my property tax, I'm not just going to walk out of my house and hand you the keys. Right. But eventually, you will have walked out of your house. Well, that brings me to the next question. Let, let me just get through the questions here. Um, it, that re leads me right into the next question. Because if it's possible for the city to sell what I thought was my property, then who owns the property that I actually believe is mine? I mean, I own a piece of property here in Keene. I paid for it. I own it outright. There's oh, no outright. mortgage yep. sitting on it. You I own mean, that property. It is my piece of You're saying I own that, that I property? believe you own that property. So there how are strong is it property rights in the state of New Hampshire, as I understand it. How can that be that if I own the property, that the city can sell my property out from under me without my agreement? Well, it's a process that's been provided for by the state legislature in order to, uh, to develop the revenue source that's necessary to offset the cost of police, fire, education, things of that nature. Not not everyone would pay for police, for example. Some would, some would only pay for... Um, fire service and would want to um, absolve themselves from other payments, but there's a total cost of government and there is a constituency for every aspect of it and it's determined to be in the in the common good that these things are paid for and that, and that the one way of course is through property taxes and it's through the common good that the actual assessment is made. The fact that you don't recognize it as a benefit to yourself, um, apparently it, it does not absolve you from having to make that payment and if you don't, then the city would be justified through state law to take the property on the tax lien and to right. sell and the property, pay itself that which, which was necessary to operate city government, uh, whatever your tax bill is, and then deliver you the difference. Okay. So it doesn't really need to come to that. By paying your property taxes, um, right. you, you pay for your fair share of the cost of the services of well, this community. Now that's and kind of prosper. an interesting And point. the argument is that you prosper from being in this community. You prosper from every aspect of your enjoyment of this community. You prosper from the fact that there's an educational system that brings many people uh, to a point where they can be better citizens and be more productive in their lives. I, uh, you prosper through safety, through the fact that there is a readiness to serve should you need the fire service, should you need police service. Sure. And sure. we and prosper you know, by attracting businesses and other people to our community who might not come here if this community did not have with many things that are necessary. I actually um, mentioned in my uh, letter here that I am interested in certain services that the city provides because the city has a monopoly on those services. There is no other police, you know, there's no competing police or competing fire service that I could hire. So I am interested to some extent in having some of those services. But there are others, um, like education, as you mentioned, that I have a fundamental disagreement with and I am not interested in, uh, in you know, contributing to that particular system. It doesn't mean I'm not interested in educating children. It just means that I'm interested in perhaps, um, you know, giving my renters in the duplex that I own uh, $1,000 back, you know, knocking $100 a month off of their rent, which they could really use and they could use that to educate their daughter in the way they want to. But what I'm hearing you say, what I'm understanding you, is that there's some sort of, you know, implied obligation that we're all living underneath, or else uh, somebody's going to, to take my home from me if I don't go along with this, even though I have a fundamental disagreement with what is arguably not an essential service at all, because I'd still be willing to contribute my money to educating kids in the way I think it should be done. But I don't have a voice, and I'm not interested in spending my time going through these uh, these processes to try to change the system and mold it in the way that I want. Also because I don't want to force my views on everybody else. And so what I'm concerned with, John, is that you, you're going to come up against a situation. I mean, I can see this off in the distance, and this is kind of a taste, I guess, in advance. The situation is going to be that there are going to be more people that are going to be taking a position similar to mine that are going to say, well, yeah, we like fire protection, but these government schools, not so great. So would you be all right with a you know check for 40 percent considering the government schools are about 60 percent of the property taxes would uh would a 40 percent check 
per, um, persuade the city people to not take my home from me. Well, first, the city people don't want your home, and, and the city people. Well, they are, want the money. The They'll city sell people my are representative of the people of this community. They're elected from this community, and they're elected to do the best that they can relative to the decisions that have to be made. And they, but they also, they also have to follow uh, the law, and the law governs who participates in the cost of uh, community education. The law governs. Uh, who participates in the cost of police and fire and other services, and why it's spread across uh, the majority or the, all the homeowners of the community unless they're exempted for whatever particular purpose. And some have been, obviously, we have tax-exempt properties. Whether you and I as uh, homeowners would be exempted, probably not. But we know that there are charitable organizations, for example, that have been exempted. So the law does allow for certain exemptions. It also allows for you to get a, a fair hearing relative to your property and the payment of any taxes associated with it uh, and to make sure that you're being assessed at the appropriate level. As far as the educational piece goes, and you know I can't really speak to that, uh, this has been an, an ongoing debate for many, many years relative to what would be the appropriate system. I would simply encourage you to continue to have that debate and to take uh, whatever measures you can within the law uh, to stimulate that conversation and if it needs, if it needs any type of reform for you, to be, for you and others to be part of that. Now, as far as the city government goes, um, you know, I, I can only say to you that, there, that, that we have a fair process. It is based on um, an equalized assessment and value every year. It does follow statutes very carefully, and we're certainly not interested in anyone uh, not having their property. If you were to send us a check for 40%, unfortunately, I'm not able to take it. So you wouldn't even be able to, if it's not I don't think, the I, I don't believe total we can amount. take it. Well, I think we have to take, now, does that mean we wouldn't take it as a partial payment? Particularly if you were struggling and you're not, but if you were one of those people that was struggling yeah. and said to us, I want to make payments on my taxes. We do everything we possibly can uh, to assist people relative to the payment of their taxes. Right. Which is one of the reasons why we've had so few people who have actually en ended up with a bad situation. Um, and uh, for, the, for the most part, the city does not want to take anyone's property, and we haven't. I'm guessing haven't. that the, the uh, two, there are two questions here that I'm guessing probably be best for the Attorney General. I'll throw them out. Um, in Ms. Alther's letter, she stated, the city of Keene acts with statutory authority granted to it by the New Hampshire legislature. That's true. So the question is, what is factually, factually, what is statutory authority? And how did the people calling themselves the legislature get get it to grant to the city in the first I could place? ask the city attorney to come over and address that particular question for you, if he can. Is he here today? He's here today. If you want to just hold off on that, we just... No, I'm, I'm not in a position to, other than get, tell you what I've already told you. Okay. And obviously, you know, I think there are others who could probably do more. There is one question. I still think that the attorney general's office is probably the right place to go relative okay. to that I'll question. I'll save the next one for that, but number eight, definitely something I think you might be able to answer. Okay. Uh, the check that I sent has been deposited. Yes. And um, I'm wondering which person within this organization is responsible for depositing that check? I, I think we would normally have... <laughs> I think you're going to have to hold the city responsible, I guess. So the city as, an enti as a corporate well, the entity? The city acts as an entity. Mary Alpha doesn't come to a particular person and say, can I ch cash this check? She, might, she may have discussed with uh, her immediate supervisor, which would be the finance director, uh, and uh, the and city attorney and myself, mm -hmm. and said, you know, I have a letter. Yeah. But the letter itself does not, as far as we know, absolve anyone from paying their tax. Uh, their taxes, well, and if you send a if you send a check for your taxes, right, it's going to get deposited. Well, the, the the issue was with the check, and the, the check actually had terms. The check's terms were that you may deposit the check after you answer the questions, in hopes that that would actually get me the questions answered sooner rather than later. But they went ahead and just deposited the check, and nobody answered my questions right. until today. So that's why I wanted to see if I could actually trace down if there was any one individual responsible. But you're telling me the corporate entity known as the city. That really is a corporate. Is I mean, I, we are responsible. Any check that comes in, you know, we're going to cash that check. There's no one person to mm -hmm. say, well, this person person said cash it, this person said no, can't cash it, it would be what is, what is the authority of the city to cash the check? And the authority is that we have, as we understand it, a legal right, meaning the community now, to assess property taxes and to uh, cash the checks that come in accordingly. Okay, I know you're here to just answer my questions. I don't know if you want to field questions from these gentlemen here. I don't know if they have any questions, but that's up no, to I'm you. No, I'm here to talk to you. I, 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 you know, I, I think that um, 
you know, with what I've heard from you and, and always have heard from you and, uh, is that you're a respectful person and I'm giving you back some respect. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, that's all I was looking for was just those answers. Yeah. I have, did have one question. I think only one. Um, the law doesn't di uh, dictate morality. Why does a city refuse to recognize conscious objectors? I think Ian hit, hit, hinted on that. When I'm he, not quite sure what I understand that. I'm that we don't recognize conscientious objectors. Conscientious objectors, and, and not in terms of traditional military. Huh? You, okay. you have nothing to do with that. But Ian said he doesn't support a, a, a monopolistic or government oh, run education. But he does support some of the other things, and he's stated he's at least interested in paying for those. Well, I, it's not that we're not supporting someone that's right to be a conscientious objector. We just don't have a process that allows for that. We still have to collect the taxes owed for the services that have been rendered. Now, I recognize those services may not have been rendered directly to Ian, but they're here for him and for others, and they make this a better community, and they preserve and protect the safety and welfare of this community. Now, he does obviously have, uh, you know, the, there is a process, and it may not be recognized, uh, but he can not pay those taxes, but there's a penalty that goes along with that. But I risk, I risk death by, exactly. by doing that. But people, you know, it wasn't that Someone's many years going ago to hurt that me. people who were conscientious objectors risked uh, the loss yeah. of jobs and ridicule and things of that nature. I'm not saying that you need to risk those things or that you will have those things happen to you, but I'm saying right. that conscientious objectors, whether it's I would hope it didn't happen. across the board, have always had, uh, you know, there's always a consequence to our actions, yeah. as you know me. You know, sure, and sure. the consequence of not paying one's property taxes or federal income taxes, which is another area that people have been arguing about for many, many years relative to the constitutionality of federal income taxes, um, there is a consequence. Okay. And you know, it's the same for all of us in this room, each and every one of us, including me. I have a question. Um, I'd like to draw an analogy first. Uh, let's say we were all hungry. We were going to go get something to eat. And say maybe you weren't hungry or maybe you didn't want much to eat. And, uh, but anyway, we decided to go to an expensive restaurant to get, you know, a couple hundred dollar bottle of wine, lived up, and you didn't want anything. But we still were going to make you pay for the food that we ate, or the food that you didn't eat. Well, and whether you, whether you like that or not, you're still forced to pay for it. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, uh, a good analogy between it's imperfect, what we're talking like about. all analogies are, but I think well, it's not even close in to, my opinion. To compare it to say no property taxes. disrespect meant, but I to me I don't see it as the same. To to compare it to say property taxes, I'm I'm not hungry for right. police protection. I'm not hungry for government schools. Well, let's say I buy the top of the line car and I and I hawk everything to do it. Uh, and then I go around saying, you know, you ought to buy one of these too. You don't have to do that. That's a personal decision that you make. And if where you spend your money relative to your appetite is not the same. What we're recognizing is that there's been a communal lifestyle by human beings for thousands of years and that there's been a contribution to the community good. We now it's now it's it's evolved into something that's highly debatable and there's a debate going on and I think you represent one aspect of that debate. But there has been a communal lifestyle for human beings in this in a society for many, many years. And, and, and as a result of that, there's been a recognition that the common good is served and that all individuals are prospered potentially according to their means through the common good. That's the best I can tell you. Who, who is the, uh, the best person to determine what the common good is? Well, I, that's why I think we have a representative government, because it's up to us. But we have to do it through our representatives. Would not the common good be defined as um, allowing people to interact with one another voluntarily? Yes, it could very well be that way. I like how you use the term evolution uh, in your last uh, answer because I think that's what we're uh, beginning to see here is that there's going to be a demand soon, John, for, for um, voluntary interaction in that if the government's police and fire and education services are so great as many of the government people would have us believe, then like every other service in the marketplace, they should be offered on a voluntary basis. If I don't want to purchase uh, goods and services from Walmart, there's zero chance that Walmart will have the ability or the interest in coming to my house and throwing me out onto no, the street. I so, so I think that's what we're all hoping we'll see change in the future as more people decide that they're not interested in participating in this system that has been created uh, for them to participate in as they withdraw consent 
and demand that uh, the services be offered on a voluntary basis. I, I don't, you know, I'm sorry that that may put you and your associates in an, in an uncomfortable position no, to where the city may, I mean, I don't know how it will look if the city is, people are throwing others out of their homes. I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't do it during the winter time, but uh, yeah, you know, anybody out of in the, home, yeah. well, you know, if if somebody doesn't, pay, that's because people pay. So if somebody decides to not pay or decides to, you know, cut a check to the to the fire department or cut a check to, you know, whoever you know, on their own and say, you know, I don't want to pay for these uh, government schools, then you are going to be put into a situation where you either will have to ignore what's going on or violence will have to be initiated against that person uh, taking their home and th literally throwing them out of their homes. And I don't know if that's going to be a position you guys are going to be in. Hopefully you won't want to do those things to people. Uh, so I'm just letting you know that that could be coming at some point All right, soon. Well, thank you for that. And, I, and what I would say to you is that I, wouldn't, that I would probably not agree with you. Well, whether a few people might do that or not, I don't know. Certainly uh, that might be something that crosses your mind as the appropriate thing to do. And I understand that. Uh, I hope you don't do it. But if you do, and you do it for reasons of conscience, then so, then you know, obviously, um, that will be your choice. Relative to services rendered in the community, the community always has the ability to say what it wants. That's why we go through the elaborate budget process. If the community did not want a full-time fire service, believe me, it would not have one. If it felt that it didn't want to pay for paramedics and an ambulance service, uh, because we do have to subsidize it in part, then we wouldn't have one. We just wouldn't have it because the community always makes the final choice. Now, the fact that they use their elected representatives does not mean uh, that the community's voice won't be heard. But even though it might take a little bit of a little bit more time, particularly through an elected representative system, the community voice will eventually be heard. And certainly here, where the grassroots are, there's no there's no getting away from you know your friends and neighbors and and and, and everybody knows everybody in a community like Keene. And believe me, if people didn't want these services in mass, they wouldn't have them. Because that's, what it would, that's all it would take. But they, they don't have the opportunity to say they don't want them. Because well, if they say that with their wallets, then they have the threat of violence being used against no, them. No, not really. I mean, I think that you have to pay your taxes while the tax burden is there. But if the, indeed the tax burden is lessened because over the course of several years, for example, the community decides uh, through whatever means it's lawful and reasonable for them to take, uh, would, that they don't want a, well, they don't want a, fire, a full time fire department. They wouldn't have one. It was the community that decided they wanted the full-time fire department, and quite rightfully so. When you consider that there's, you know, uh, several billion dollars worth of, uh, of of community property and property necessity. I don't think the fire department would have any problem generating money on a voluntary basis. So well, you know, I've worked I, in places where they have voluntary fire departments, and not as in not volunteer workers. I mean, no. like every other entity in the no. marketplace. They were doing exactly what you said, and it became an incredible was down in Florida, and they actually had a fire department that was selling its services, and so you had to be a subscriber. And then if your house burned, and you weren't a subscriber, and the fire department stood by and watched it burn, think about the consequences of that and the problem that that engendered. Well, we'll Very few even. people, when their house is burning, are going. that's when they're going to want to make all their back payments. And this actually happened in a few that's, places down that's in Florida. The same, that's the same with flood insurance, too. You know, everybody, nobody wants flood insurance. Well, that's not true, but... Well, this you know, community... People, oh, go ahead and finish. I'm sorry. But that, that's exactly what happens with that. You know, uh, you hear about it about every time a flood hits Missouri or Iowa. Um, someone didn't expect flood insurance. Didn't expect to have to need flood insurance. I'm sure But enough. a flood doesn't jump. A fire can. For example, let's say that your house is on fire uh, or and you haven't paid your subscription. Whatever reason you couldn't afford it, whatever happened, you didn't pay it. You you decided to take a trip to Acapulco that year and not not pay your subscription. So your house, which is 50 feet away from somebody else's house, is on fire now. The fire department or the fire service isn't responding because you haven't paid for your your portion of the cost of this service, which may be inadequate because there is inadequate revenue to actually support to support it. And now your house or the house next door is in jeopardy of going up in flames. Certainly yeah. understand your position, John. I don't think we need to get into it. As Thanks. I said, I'm not here to argue. I just wanted to get some answers. No, so no. I know you, you offered the uh, services of the attorney. It's past five. You've got things to do, family to Indeed. see. That's fine. So, I mean, if he wants to come in and chat for a few minutes, that's his choice. I'm sure. Well, we'll see if he can. Okay. And uh, no, that's fine. And, uh, you know, and I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the conversation, you know, the fact that I don't necessarily agree with you. Now, why do you keep smirking?
Oh, I just do that. Is that your face? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No problem. Any, any, I don't know if I'm saying something really any, crazy. We don't want you. conflict. Um, no, definitely don't want conflict. I, I'm I'm worried at some point it will come down to that. Never, never anything violent. I mean, world, world. But at some point, someone's going to decide not to pay something that it's the government happened before. dictates that they are should on a conscientious basis, and and that's when the police, with their guns, authorities, and Will come in. We we could have oh, we could have many conversations about all these things. You know, I I, I can only tell you that um, if there's always a price to be paid for everything that we do. You know, we're responsible for our actions, and there's a price to be paid. And there hasn't yet been a conscientious objector who hasn't paid some price. You know, for taking the position they have. But because, and I'm sorry for sounding preachy. I don't mean this to sound preachy. You no, know, this conversation has gotten very philosophical yeah, at times. Anyway, yeah, it does. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, I, I won't go on any further. But I, I do appreciate your, your viewpoint. I just can't tell you that there won't be a consequence as a result of it, and um, it won't be the first time. I think our, our history of our country is filled with. We I think we with expect consequences. Who have, who have have suffered consequences in order to make changes. Now, whether the change you're at talking about here today is one that would be universally accepted, I don't think it would. That's the difficulty we face. I don't think it would. And I don't think democracy is great as long as you're not a minority, and not just in skin color and or religion and the traditional framework of minority. If you're a political minority or a uh, just whatever you believe or or, do so, or, or or position you hold, if your view is not taken by this view as uh, fifty one percent of, of of whoever votes or of the population or of who's ever in power at the time. Democracy is great for everybody. Well, how long do you think it took for women to get the vote? I'm sorry? How long did it take women to get the vote? You're a student of American government. Almost 200 years. It took, yeah. How long did it take for the Civil Rights Movement after the Civil War was over to actually actually come about and actually have a, a real commitment on the part of a number of people and actually to affect the laws of this country? And how, and long, how long has it been take? since some of those laws and, the, and, and some of that commitment has actually generated the kind of spirit, you know, and uh, that, that that hopefully we all thought was something that was a God-given right. Uh, that's that an all interesting, people. interesting question because while women did not have the vote, were they legitimately discriminated against? Well, my point there is not necessarily to get into the philosoph philosophy of it, but just to simply say, how long does any cause take? Well, first off, it doesn't matter if it's the local government and the bureaucrats like myself, or the politicians, or the citizens of the community. It always takes people time to get their mind around any idea. It's what true. you start as one, and you know this, and you're working at it, obviously, as hard as you possibly can, uh, but you may not see you may not see the results, and then again you may not see results that you originally anticipated. They may look completely different. Doesn't mean the discussion isn't worthwhile having. But right now, I would give you all the good advice of making sure you pay your property taxes, and uh, and then if you want to change the system, I'd say work from within. I understand you may not feel you may not agree with me, but that, for example, if you run for a legislative position. Uh, that you become a legislator, that you that you, um, you you try to affect the change that allows people to pick and choose services if you think that you can get support for that over time. I guess the next question in your series of questions of how long did it take, how long did it take, how long will it take for government people to start doing business on a voluntary basis like the rest of us? Well, my answer earlier was that what we do, for example, uh, I've, I've seen um, We've gone out. We've privatized certain aspects of city government. For example, whether it be fleet services or wastewater treatment plant operations, etc. Um, and what I've learned over time is that when a city government um, applies performance measures and good business principles, most of what they do—not all, but most of what they do—they uh, do the best. And that there are very few companies that even want to get involved in the th something like um, fire service per se. Now, there are companies that get involved in the ambulance business, but why is that? Why would a company be an ambulance provider but not a fire suppression provider? Because there's no money in fire suppression. That's why they don't do it, or they'd be doing it. There is money in ambulance service, and you know where the ambulance money is? It's not in going out and taking care of you and me. So, we so have if there's no money in these services, why are they offered at all? 
Why, why, why would not people demand that? Because the common good is that, and they have demanded it. Where do you think the fire companies came from? I if mean, you look at a steady you progression... Would you pay someone to protect yeah, your house yeah. fire? Well, they are paying for it, and the mechanism they've chosen, which they said is the fairest mechanism, is property taxes. Because they're basically saying that that's how they can determine benefit. It's an assessment of benefit. You know, the first fire, first professional uh, fire department was uh, run by an insurance company out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. And, and what happened? Why isn't it still in the business? I'm not certain. You'll find a whole host of reasons for it, some of which are probably uh, quite sketchy and others which are very legitimate. But the point is, for instance, in a place like Keene, New Hampshire, it started out as a voluntary, comp a voluntary department where people came out with buckets and there'd be a hose pumper thing. And over time, they've caught the community determined that it was in its best interest to have the more expensive equipment and eventually to have a full-time fire presence, which they, and then they determined that it was in their best interest and they could do it best for their citizens to have an ambulance service. And eventually that worked from EMTs up to paramedics. And now we provide a paramedic intercept to the towns that are, you know, that are contracted with us. And we have million dollar pieces of equipment. You, you buy one of those big ladder trucks and it's huge for us. If I may, for a moment, I, I, I just want to say I appreciate you. I've kind of just listened and kept quiet. Um, if the city at one point did agree, uh, why are we now held to that contract? Imagine your father bought a contract on a house. Uh, or uh, your neighbor even, which just because they bought that contract, they couldn't possibly hold you liable to that contract. Um, so it's, it seems to me, uh, it's it's actually contrary to contractual law to hold us obligated to something we never signed to. It's uh, the it's an implicit agreement. But I mean, uh, do you do you believe in the social contract? It's yes or no. Yes, I mean, like no. you you said. Um, the social contract, it's implicit, it's unilateral, it's geographic. It applies to the city of Keene. It's unilateral, it comes from right. the top down. Yes. And uh, it's implicit. By living here, we agree to the social contract, right? Yes. Uh, but what if I had a social contract car dealership? I sent out letters to everybody saying, um, and within 10 block radius, uh, choose between uh, a BMW or Volkswagen. Uh, if you don't choose, you'll get whatever the popular choice is, and here's the bill enclosed for thirty thousand dollars. If I took this claim, and you know, people would right, rightfully laugh at me and say, "Well, this is ridiculous." And if I went to a court to uh, bring my claim, I'd be left out of the court, which you know, right. obvious. But the courts and the governments here operate on pretty much the same principle. Well, we, see, this is where we disagree. First off, they have to establish a community purpose or a public purpose. They can't just provide something because they want to do it, because there's some egocentric person or what have you that says, I want to have everybody in this community uh, with a BMW in their front yard. First off, the state doesn't grant that authority. It's not within the public domain, domain in terms of an authority. It's not, it's not there. And, and, and there's, no, there's no way uh, that that could be enforced. Uh, it, it's ludicrous. Now, we talked about the contract that, that might be implicit. I think that there is a contract that's implicit because every year there's an annual budget process. Through this budget process, we reallocate funds. In essence, we reallocate those funds. We say, okay, now you can look at it a whole host of ways. You can say, well, all they're doing is just approving what they had the previous year. There's truth in that. Oftentimes, they're approving what they had the previous year. They're also re-examining it, though. In theory, they're re-examining their expenditures every year and making a decision. And the decision is to continue on with that service. Now, there are people who, when they're in the fire service, for example, or police service, or, or whatever it might be, youth services, or what have you, that are going to come in and they're going to justify their budget. <coughs> These are people, paid professionals, yes, of course they're going to do that. And they're going to answer questions and justify their budget. And then the contract is implicit again because the, co the city council or the community, if it's a, if it's a you know, a, uh, a town meeting government style, are going to then ratify the contract. In this particular case, in the city of Keene, it's done through your elected representatives. If you were living in Marlboro, Swansea, this town meeting day, and you basically ratify the contract through a majority of citizens who come in and vote what they want. Because I guarantee you, if, with the exception of the schools now, when there's default budgets and you're not able to really discontinue a school program, with the exception of the school program, 
you basically have the right uh, to determine the level of service that you'll receive from the community. And you only get that much that you're willing to pay for in common. Now, the individuals cannot pull out. If they own property in that community, they cannot pull out. They have to be part of the majority. That's the system that we live in. Well, that's the system that you live in, and I think yeah. you're going to find more people are going to choose to not live in that system, I think but yet wrong. still live in King. I guess we can leave it there unless uh, there's anything else that anyone wanted to discuss. Should I get the attorney? Or That'd be great if he's available. He's yeah. yeah, if he's here. And Unfortunately, the city attorney was unwilling to answer Ian's questions while being recorded, so Ian didn't even ask them. You are being audio recorded right now. Ah, which I don't give you permission for. Yeah. You understand that, right? May I have your permission? No, you don't have my permission to audio record. Okay. What would you like to talk about? Well, we can't talk without the recording. Oh, what?